Holding. Welcome to another edition of Camp Check Q&A. First, I'd like to send a shout out to some friends, Stefan and Victoria over there in Ukraine. Big shout out to you guys. Love you guys. And I am praying for you and hoping for a good outcome uh, through everything that you guys are all going through. Just want you to know you're my thoughts and my prayers. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. This water, this water comes straight out from the mountain here. And the water is flowing right from underneath this rock. Ah. I've been down here for a few days now with a very good friend of mine who lives down here named David. And we're doing some filming and some shooting and practicing some survival skills. Um, it's been an incredible experience. I haven't been down here for almost uh, three years. So it's been very interesting coming again after after so many years and, and, and seeing how my skills have improved. And I'm noticing new things, new plants. I'm discovering new things. It's been really good. And it's really interesting when you get out into the world and start exploring you end up having more questions. The more you learn, the more questions you have. And so there's so much more to explore here and I hope to get back down here again soon. So I want to address the, some of the recent questions that I've been, uh, or comments that I've been reading in my YouTube comments lately. Now, a lot of people have, have uh, expressed concern regarding the loss of heat in my hut. Especially after seeing the last video when it snowed and it was cold and yes, I understand that the hut is not fully insulated. I understand I need a door. Again, I, can, I can't stress this enough. When I'm making videos, it's so time consuming. I was collecting materials to make a door when the snow started coming down. I had to just leave my stuff behind and, and, and get back to the hut. And so the snow became the topic of my of my video, you know, so it was no more, I didn't have time to do a door. Um, so that's how it goes. Uh, many times when I'm out there, I have plans, ideas of what I want to record and what I want to share, but nature has other plans. And so I just go with the flow most of the time. So I'm gonna get to that, but here's the thing. As I said, when I was putting the roof, before I started putting the roof on the hut, I said that the hut's not finished yet. I'm gonna be making it taller. And so I understand that there's heat loss happening between the bottom of the roof and the top of the wall. There's a gap about an inch thick and air freely comes through there. And yes, there's heat loss and the roof isn't finished yet. I still have to put more juniper bark material up there. So I understand all that. I'm totally aware of it. But again, the filming is very time consuming and knowing that I'm going to be doing more construction on the hut, hut, I'm gonna be removing the roof. Having that in mind, I don't wanna to put too much effort and time into making this one perfect when I'm going to be disassembling part of it very soon. So spring is just, it's gonna be next month. It's gonna be here in April. So I'm not worried about that. Um, the weather is warmer now. I'm sure that was the last time it chance of snow for this season. Um, so you're gonna see in very soon in upcoming videos when I take down the roof and I finish building the hut and Then when I do finish that it's going to be better insulated. It's gonna have windows. It's gonna, and it's gonna have a door So you just wait until that happens. Okay another common question is do I have first aid kit with me in case of an emergency in case I injure myself or I get sick. I used to carry a first aid kit, a small little box, small plastic box that had, it had just like band-aids, wrap, sterile wipes, uh, ointments, antibacterial ointment, 
It had several little things like that, scissors for cutting the tape or for cutting a wound. Um, and you know what happened? Nothing happened. <laughs> Every time I would go out, I never had a need for it. And so I just saw it as extra baggage, extra weight. I figured that, you know, if I get an injury or something, I just, I need to get out, you know? Um, if it's an injury that's serious enough, you know, that little first aid kit's not gonna do a lot of good. So if I get injured, if I get a cut, I don't do anything about it, and I've never had an infection or anything. I get cuts all the time, that's, that's normal. I don't worry about trying to put a Band-Aid on it or, or sterilizing it or putting antibacterial ointment. I just keep going, and I've never had a problem. So that's why I don't worry about it too much. Now if something serious happens, like if I were to fall off a cliff from 12, 20 feet and land on rocks, I'm probably gonna be broken up pretty bad and far beyond what any first aid kit is going to do. Any, you know, mobile first aid kit. So that's a serious thing that I have to avoid. I can't allow, I can't put myself into a dangerous situation where I'm taking that kind of a risk. So I have to always be alert and, and do my best. But I'm not worried about small cuts and bruises. I get them all the time and they're annoying, and, but I gotta keep going, you know, so, and they heal. That's the great thing about the human body. It has the ability to heal itself. Ugh. This water is, this is what I've been drinking the past few days. It's, it's very clean, it's, and something interesting is, this water that's coming out of here is warmer than the water in the river. I don't know why because the, the uh, waterfall that's just uh, right down there a little ways, the water is really cold, it's frigid. And, um, and it's interesting because they're both water sources are coming from inside the mountain. But for some reason, the water from the, these little springs, there's another one there and another one down there, that, this water is warm. Interesting observation. I'm gonna take you guys to um, another spot and I'll answer some more questions. Right now, carefully climbing up this steep, steep rocky slope. I have to be careful while well, the rocks are kind of sharp in areas. I also have to be careful of a certain plant that's called, what well has several names, it's called Velvet Bean. And Velvet Bean, there's actually one right there. It's also called Devil Bean, Mad Bean. See this pod right here, this bean pod, is covered in tiny little hairs. And those hairs are extremely irritating to the skin. This bean is actually not native to Mexico. It's from Africa and tropical Asia. But one time here, a few years ago, I was collecting firewood, and it was about this time of year, and uh, it was at night, and I went into the, the brush to collect firewood, and all of a sudden, I was carrying the firewood back to the campfire, and I had this incredible itch. It was driving me absolutely mad. It felt like a million tiny little insects, smaller than ants, crawling all over my arms. And I literally went mad. I went crazy and I ran into the river and I was just like scrubbing my arms in the river. And within like 10 minutes of being in the water, the itching stopped and I felt better. And so it wasn't until later when I, uh, I researched and looked up information trying to identify what that was and then I found out that it's velvet bean. It's also called mad beans or devil bean because it is really, it really will drive you crazy. Fortunately though, it doesn't last very long, but it's the tiny little hairs that contain a protein that, that uh, reacts with the skin. And I swear, every time I come up here, I get a little bit of it because I think the hairs are, because the pods are drying out now and the hairs disperse, I think. 
and so any plant you touch you're likely to get some of the hairs on you and so I get this itchy feeling every time I come up here and it's happening right now it's really annoying <laughs> once again I want to thank you all for the comments I love reading the comments and I again I apologize I'm sorry I'm not able to get to to all of them I really do try but it is very time-consuming but I want you to keep them coming there is so much information good stuff in there great questions they make me think I even like the negative criticism you know um, I mean you don't have to be harsh I mean but if you want to bring something up make a point about something that I'm doing wrong that I could do better at I appreciate that because I'm learning from you guys as well nobody knows everything you know we come from different experience different backgrounds and so I really appreciate all that information. There's a wealth of knowledge in those comments. Um, another question I often get is, how did I get into doing primitive stuff? And it's a, it's kind of a long story, but I always, as a child, loved being in nature, loved exploring. Used to go, um, me and my friends used to go hunting for lizards, not to eat them, but just to catch them, collect them, um, and then we'd release them later. The reptiles were very interesting to me. I loved them. We used to look for snakes too, but rarely found them. So I was always an outdoors type of kid. But later on in life, I, as I became an adult, I, I realized I had an interest in languages and cultures, indigenous cultures. Something about it just really caught my interest and I uh, always loved you know, the handmade crafts that, um, that people's made in these little villages. Um, I traveled a lot in Mexico and visited a lot of villages and, and met and saw the people, you know, the people that make these things, mats and baskets and hats out of palm and all that stuff was just so fascinating to me. And I, but for a long time, I just, I loved it. I thought that'd be cool to be able to do it, but I never tried. And so it was several years later that I started getting more into like survival type of, of uh, practice and it started with wild edible foods um, I thought it was just really cool to be on a hike or a run out in the hills and to find plants to eat on the way I love doing that and so I, I had a few books about wild edible plants and I would go out in the hills and start identifying and little by little I learned more and more and I found that I could didn't really have to buy vegetables anymore I could eat wild plants instead and uh, so I saw some uh, potential economic value in that. And then when the recession hit in 2008, I think it was 2008, times were really tough and I had to uh, really reduce spending and sacrifice a lot. And that's when the whole survival thing really started to get interesting to me. A lot of it was facing my comforts and trying to, trying to make my body more capable of enduring discomforts but because I found that I if I could for example if I could work more more hours and and sleep less or eat less and keep going or endure just other discomforts to make myself more productive then I found I found a lot of value in that especially in, in tough economic times and so um, I really started thinking about what could I do you know what, what if things get worse you know um, and I started thinking about the future. Things weren't going very good. You know, I was thinking maybe in the future, not too far from now, I'm really going to need to learn how to make a house out of materials I find out of nature. Go out into the mountains and build, create a home, a small home, a place where I could live and, and uh, find food and, and make fire. All that suddenly became very, almost necessary to learn. Excuse me, I gotta take a drink of water. It's a beautiful day today. The past two days were cool, cloudy. Now it's all sunshine. It's warm though, I wanna get back into that water. Um, another common question that I get, and I've actually seen this question so many times, and I'm surprised it's actually a question. But the question goes, how do you trim your fingernails? So, I don't know if people really are wondering that, but 
to me, I kind of take it as like, yeah, right, you're doing primitive skills, you're spending time out there like that, I don't believe it. Look at your fingernails, how trim they are. You know what, my fingernails, they get torn up when I come out here. I wish they would stay longer because I need some more protection. The problem with having short fingernails out here is because so much of the work, you know, you're handling raw materials and especially when digging and picking up rocks, um, digging in sand, or when I'm making my, working with the clay or making adobe bricks, my hands are, are going into that mud, to that raw material, and it's abrasive. And all of that friction and abrasion naturally wears down the fingernails. It wears down the skin of my hands. I gotta take breaks for a couple days, you know, just to, let, to allow the skin to heal and the fingernails to grow back. So I don't trim my nails. I literally don't think I have ever used clippers to trim my nails. You know, sometimes I'll be working and a nail will get cut, you know, and so I will peel the rest of it off because it's annoying me. I've, tr I've uh, peeled my fingernails uh, so short before that they've actually bled, you know. So, um, so it happens naturally. I don't need to trim them. I don't do pedicures either on my feet, okay? Uh, it's kind of the same thing. Actually, with my toenails, I will, when the nails are wet, they become soft, and you can actually peel off the ends. And so that's what I do sometimes. Some of my toenails occasionally get in bad shape, and so I have to uh, clean them and, and peel off the, the damaged part. Why don't we now go to the camp? Let's go check out the camp and I'll show you around my home for the past couple of days. velvet bean hairs got on me. I don't know how I didn't actually touch the plant or the bean, but those hairs get everywhere in the forest. You can't really avoid them, I think, at certain times of the year. <sighs> I started going mad, <sighs> but the water is the best cure. The itching will stop in five minutes. Oh, well, this leads me to another common question how do I protect myself from the Sun look at that Sun it's a nice warm day it's a beautiful day to be in the water I don't want to carry that anymore well as you can see right now it is almost the middle of the day so the Sun is going to be most intense at this time of the day and if getting sunburnt is a true concern then the best thing to do is stay out of the Sun cover up with clothes, things like that. And that's what I do. I try to do most of my outdoor work in the morning or late afternoon. Inevitably, um, there's times you gotta do your work. You gotta wait for this wind to pass. It's kinda strong. That wind comes traveling down the canyon and sometimes it gets pretty strong. So again, regarding the sun, the best thing to do is to avoid the sun at the hottest times of the day. Say between like 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. That's generally what I follow. Um, I'm not concerned about about you know damage from the sun unless I'm unless I get sunburnt. You want to avoid being sunburnt, and that's what I that's what I try to do. Sometimes I do still get burnt. Um, and when I was a child, I got burnt kind of bad a, f a few times. But um, I don't use sunscreen. I have not used any sunscreen in many, many years. Sunscreen contains chemicals, which can also be damaging to the, to the body. So the best thing is just to cover up, wear a, a wide-brimmed hat, 
wear a shirt that the sun doesn't penetrate, pants, things like that. Um, but sun is good for you as well for vitamin D. My dad worked in the sun his entire life and he was exposed for many hours all day in the kind of work that he did and he never used sunscreen and he worked with his shirt off through the hot summer days and with no protection and he is 80 years old and has never had cancer and is in very good health so um, do what you think's best for you but um, understand this that the Sun has been around for a very long time and maybe uh, doing what a lot of the wild animals do they you know a lot of animals have fur so they have a natural protection there a lot of animals are in hiding during the day and uh, they do their feeding in the early morning or the evening so consider that you know there, there are different options and I think there's healthier ways to protect yourself than using sunscreen um, another common question is how many languages do I speak now if you're a Spanish speaker or Portuguese speaker or Russian speaker and you write a comment in Spanish or Portuguese or Russian there's a good chance I'm going to answer in your language in fact if it's Spanish and Portuguese I always answer in your language Russian I don't speak very well but I do know a little bit and um, I do have to look up words though when I answer those questions those comments but if you're a Spanish speaker and Portuguese speaker just write to me and I will reply in your language okay um, si necesitan pruebas les voy a dar ahorita una prueba que yo hablo español estudié español en la prepa cuatro años de la prepa y después trabajé en una, una fábrica donde la mayoría de los trabajadores eran de México y platicamos en español todos los días he viajado mucho en México y he vivido en México entonces mi segunda idioma mi segunda lengua es español no hablo perfecto pero estoy aprendiendo todavía está pasando mucho vento mais uma vez eu falo português também estudei sozinho é, no ano 2000 2001 eu estudei português sozinho com livros com amiz amizades no Brasil logo em 2015 eu viajei ao Brasil foi minha primeira e única viagem ao Brasil Eu adoro o Brasil, adoro o povo brasileiro. Gostei muito, muito do, da minha viagem ao Brasil. Eu fui ao Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, uh, uh, Belo Horizonte, Alagoas e Amazonas. Japanimayo para Ruski, Nyochen Horosho. Gavru, Nyemnyoga Gavru para Ruski. Um, I don't speak a lot of Russian, but I'm learning. It's time to get out of this water and get back to my camp. Ah! <sighs> back at my temporary home. Never say I'm homeless, because I have a little home here. Another common question is, would I ever go on Naked and Afraid or Alone? Those are two very popular TV shows on television now. And here's my answer. I think it was in 2017? Yeah, 2017 that I went through the whole audition and interview process for Naked and Afraid. And after all that, I thought for sure they would call me, but they didn't. And um, again, that was five years ago almost. So I tried for Naked and Afraid, and then I tried again for it, and um, nothing happened. So a few years later, 
we fast forward to 2021 and I'm contacted by someone from alone and they invite me they saw my YouTube channel and they asked me if I'd be interested in being on, on alone and I said yeah I'll be a, I'd be interested in doing that and so went through the process through the interviews creating the creating the video uh, a self recorded video of, of myself doing some skills and and saying how I'd like to be on the show and I uh, eventually was invited to the boot camp and so that was I was pretty stoked about that you know only 25 people are selected for boot camp and it was a virtual boot camp and I went through that process and it was a, it was a great experience I met new people uh, that are into the same kind of stuff that I am so it was, it was really fun and uh, educational as well but I was not selected for the final 10 to be on the next season of Alone. So that was that. Um, I have been approached by uh, producers um, or casting directors for a, a number of other shows or for networks and nothing's ever happened with any of those. So I'm very happy doing YouTube. I have tons of freedom with that. But um, I would definitely consider a, you know, a, a show in the future. I don't know if I want to do Alone though. I mean, that, that cold weather is just not really for me a friend of mine recently asked me what is he thinking about while weaving or digging or doing some other task and that's an interesting question is that because my mind really wanders when I'm doing those things for instance when I'm making cordage it's it's something that doesn't require a lot of concentration so the mind is free to to think and to ponder and that's something I really like about doing those activities um, because I have that that sense of mental freedom while I'm, while I'm still being productive and it's also very relaxing it's so relaxing to be doing those things but so I'm usually thinking about what I'm going to be doing next or um, tomorrow I think a lot about the future of what I want to do um, a lot of ideas I get while doing other tasks um, weaving um, often if I'm weaving something I'll get ideas for making uh, you know a different design for making a different type of basket or something like that or or ways I might be able to use that basket but then my mind also wanders into other things I think a lot about family or friends um, I think about you know things that are going on in the world and it, it get, it's it's a what's really nice about it though is because I'm alone and I'm not subjected to the constant flow of information is that I tend to be able to think more objectionable in a more objectionable way and I like that and I tend to um, I tend to find peace in that where the problems of the world just don't seem to bother me so much you know it's it's when you get back into society and well particularly for me when I return to society and I, I, I you know you open up your phone and you're inevitably you're gonna see headline news stories and it's usually very negative stuff in talking to people and then when people ask you oh what do you think about this what do you think about that and it's bothersome you know, it really is bothersome. So when I'm weaving and making cordage or making pottery, usually my mind is on the natural things and, and not so much of the, the problems of the world. And then my friend asked me, do you ever try talking to the wildlife just to give yourself someone to talk to or to try to make friends with adventurous animals? Well, the fact that I'm usually always alone when I'm out in nature, I do talk to things. I, but not just to the animals. Um, if an animal is close to me, for example, one time I was in the Caribbean and this iguana came up to me. He was big. This big iguana came up, and I was talking to him. <laughs> we had a little, I had a little conversation with him. But I've had, you know, other animals. If they wander close. I will I'll talk to them I'll talk to them in English 
as if they were a human being. Um, I also talk to the plants. For instance, before I harvest yucca leaves, I'll talk to the plant and thank the plant and tell the plant that I'm, I'm going to cut a few leaves and I thank the plant for the leaves and I, I praise the plant, give, you know, telling how wonderful it is and, and I'm so grateful that it, it exists and then, uh, you know, bless the plant and that it may continue to flourish and to, and to uh, continue to multiply. So in that way, um, I, I'm always communicating with nature. You know, give, especially giving, I think it's very important to give thanks for nature because all of our sustenance, all of our food, even the air we breathe, you know, the air we breathe is oxygen that's created by nature, you know, so we have a lot to give thanks for, very lot, because without nature we would not exist, so, um, and it can be rough and tough out, out there too, and probably don't feel thankful for that, but I think another way to look at it, and it's very hard to do, but when we go through those difficult times of discomfort and pain and suffering, to give thanks because that actually makes us stronger as well. So that's all I have for this edition of Camp Chat Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll do another one from another place, another time. All right, thank everyone. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for following my channel and posting the comments. Keep them coming. God bless you all.